How's everybody doing today? Good, let's try it one more time. How's everybody doing today? Good. Hey, so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, really looking forward to the message today. Before we dive in, how many of you went good uh, or Black Friday shopping? Black Friday shopping, anybody? Uh, a lot of you. How many of you stayed at home while all the other crazies went Black Friday shopping? Good. I was one of the crazies that went Black Friday shopping, and uh, I was reminded once again how horribly people drive. Right, I have never in my life seen people more aggressively try to get parking spaces than on Black Friday. And I am thoroughly convinced, once again, that most people get their driver's license out of a Cracker Jack box, right? That's what I am thoroughly convinced. Hey, before we dive into the message, say hi to the person on your right and say, tell me they, they look really good. Say, say hi to your neighbor, tell them they look really good, all right? Now turn to the other person, your second option, and tell them they look good as well, all right? If you're getting somebody's phone number right now, you're taking it too far, all righty? Hey, go ahead and grab your Bibles. Meet me in Luke. Luke 126 is where we're going to be. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We've got you covered. Somebody will get one to you. We're in page 855 if you're using the Loner Bible. Just want to give a special welcome to those joining us online. So glad that you're tuning in with us today. Book of Luke, uh, New Testament. Look for the guys' names, Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you get to John, you've gone too far. Go back to the left. This is the story of Gabriel approaching Mary and telling her that she's going to be with child. And before we dive into the scriptures today, I want to set up the context of what's happened earlier. Earlier in Luke, Gabriel's already appeared to Zachariah. He was a priest. He was old. He was well advanced in years. His wife, Elizabeth, was barren. Uh, they could not have children. Uh, Gabriel comes and he approaches Zachariah and says, hey, your wife, Elizabeth, who was once barren, is now with child. Well, Zechariah doesn't believe Gabriel. So Gabriel says, because you haven't believed me, your mouth will be closed. You will not be able to talk until your child is born. Their child would be John the Baptist. He would prepare the way for Jesus. But there's this miracle that this one lady that is old, that was barren, is now with child. And now Gabriel's going to tell Mary of a second miracle. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great uh, and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God." And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Heavenly Father, God, right now in this moment, would you allow us to focus on you and what you want to say and what you want to accomplish in our lives? God, we need you. We pray that you would work in powerful ways. God, I pray that you would take over my mind and my mouth and my heart and that you would declare the message you have for your people today. We love you and we need you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This is week one of a three-week series titled The Impact of Christmas. Impact is our word for the year and today we're looking at the reality that God is at work. Next week, God is to be worshipped. 
The week after that, God is with us. And here's why today I'm just super excited about this topic. God is at work. Because for so many of us, we're in a season where we don't see God working. Maybe we're stagnant. Maybe we're stuck. Maybe we've got this health issue, this relational issue, this physical ailment, whatever it is. And we're like, God, I don't see you. I don't sense you. I don't feel you. God, where are you? And the Christmas story reminds us that God is always at work. And we see this in the Gospels when Jesus was ministering to people. He healed a paralyzed guy. He was on the steps of the temple and Jesus heals him. It's on the Sabbath. And people complain that he's doing work on the Sabbath. And this is his response in John chapter 5. He says, up on the screen, My father is always working, and so am I. Jesus reminded us of the reality that not only is his father always working, he is always at work. So today, our encouragement, our hope, this perspective I want us to gain is that the impact of Christmas reminds us that God is always at work. Now, it's often different from the way that we work. It's often unusual, it's often distinctive, it's often unlikely, but today we're going to look at how God works, because how God works is often very different than how we would work, and he's going to work in four different ways. Number one, God works in and through unlikely times, unlikely times. God will often work either before or after what our plan is for him to work, right? And think about it just for a moment. In high school, we kind of plan out the rest of our lives, maybe in college, where we decide maybe to go to college for four years and we'll get all of our classes and we'll pick our major and be able to accomplish all that in four years. And right when we're done with college on our graduation, a week later, we're gonna meet the person of our dreams. The first person that we begin to date is gonna be the person that becomes our spouse. And we're gonna have the most amazing wedding. And then exactly two and a half, three years after that, we're gonna start having children. And we'll have four of them. And they will be perfect. They'll be blonde haired, blue eyes. And they will love each other. They will never crab at each other. We'll wake up in the mornings and they'll be snuggling next to each other because they're just so, so amazing. And then after that, on their 18th birthday, every single one of them, they will move out of the house and they will go to college. And their college will be paid for because all of them are such great students or athletes that they have all gotten scholarships. And life is going to be grand because we all have it planned out, right? Wrong, right? It doesn't work that way. Why God's Timing is often different from ours, and what often will happen is we'll decide to go to college, but instead of getting done in four years, we'll get done in six or seven years because we haven't gotten our classes, right? And then we meet the person of our dreams, but it's not the first person we meet. It's several people later because we realize that there's a lot of freaks on the dating scene, right? And we eventually get married, and we eventually have our children, and yes, we wake up, and they're not loving each other and snuggling with each other. We are trying to keep our kids from killing each other, right? And then at 18, they do not leave the house. No, at the age of 35, they are still living in the garage. And we are praying that someday they would meet the person of their dreams, right? That's just what happens. God often works before or after our ideal plan. And we see this in the Christmas story. Way before Mary's ideal plan, God begins to work. She was betrothed to Joseph, which means that she was engaged. It was this like legally binding engagement where a year later they would be married. You literally had to get a divorce for something like this because it was so strong. Uh, Families would actually pick out their children to get married to these different people. So Mary and Joseph's parents worked this out, I'm sure. And all of a sudden, she realizes at the age of maybe 13, 14, 15, she's pregnant. Angel comes to her and says, don't be afraid. This word afraid is the Greek word phobeo, which is where we get the word phobia. Don't be alarmed. Don't be frightened. Mary, it's going to be okay because, yes, you are pregnant, but what's inside of you is from the Holy Spirit. Way earlier than she ever would have imagined. Not the way that she had her life planned out. 
And I love this because Mary asks this question, how? How is it going to happen? And the angel is very clear. You know what? The Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you even though you're a virgin. And before we go any further, I want to share with you five reasons why the virgin birth is so significant. They're not in your notes. They're up on the screens. Number one is Jesus had a heavenly origin. Jesus had an earthly father. He would be fully human and then not fully God. He wouldn't be that third member of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God always has been and God always will be. He had a heavenly origin. Second of all, Jesus had a sinless nature. If Jesus had simply a biological father here as a human being, he would not have a sinless nature. Thirdly, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. If he had a earthly father, he would have a sinful nature, and then he would not be the perfect sacrifice. Fourthly, it demonstrates the uniqueness of Christ. The virgin birth is is a way of demonstrating the uniqueness of Christ. No other human being or God has ever been born this way. His birth was unique. His sinless life was unique. His resurrection was unique. His ascension was unique. This birth sets apart Jesus Christ from any other person or God that's ever lived. Fully God and fully human. And the fifth reason why the virgin birth is so powerful is because the Bible said so. Because the entire word of God is true. If we for a moment ever start not believing any aspect of the Bible, then our entire foundation for Christianity crumbles. Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born, prophesied that the virgin would give birth to the Messiah. Matthew includes it in his gospel, the virgin birth. Luke includes it, the virgin birth. Luke was a physician. Luke was a doctor. If there was ever somebody that would have not included this because they didn't believe it, it would have been Dr. Luke. But God often works in ways that are way before, that the time is way before what we could ask, or it's way later than we wanted. And we look at Elizabeth. She had been barren. She was old. And I love how Gabriel sets this up. Hey, hey, Mary, you can believe this because even Elizabeth, old Elizabeth, over the hill Elizabeth, Elizabeth that's, you know, really up there in age. Like if God can do that in her life, he can do anything. And here we see that that it would have been really easy for Elizabeth to believe that it's too late. You know, that's where so many Christians just struggle. They just believe that, you know, it's just too late. It's too late for me to have the marriage that God wants me to have. It's too late for me to be the parent that God wants me to be. It's too late for me to eventually find a spouse. It's too late for me to experience financial freedom. It's too late for me to be the mom or the dad or the grandpa or the grandma that God wants me to be. It's too late to start over. It's too late, fill in the blank. And I love how we are a part of a community here at Shelter Cove where we believe that it is never too late. A couple months ago, I had a couple that came up to me after the service And they said, you know what, we have already filed for divorce, husband and wife here together. And they said, "Um, is there somebody that can help us reconcile our marriage? And with a big smile, I said, absolutely. So I connected them with John Harder. John Harder met with them. John Harder sent me an email this last week and said, Jeremy, that couple, uh, they have recommitted their lives and their marriage to Jesus Christ. Yeah, you can clap about that. That's worthy of clapping. He says they they tore their divorce papers in half and they are committed to going to classes and counseling that will help them strengthen their marriage. Why? Because they refused to believe it was too late. Our Thanksgiving Eve service, we had a man here that was in his 60s and he stood up and shared what he was thankful for. That this year he has experienced freedom from two different addictions in his life. Why? Because he refused to believe it was too late. See, God works in unlikely times, usually before or after what our plan would be. He did that in Mary's life. He did that in Elizabeth's life. He's going to do that in our lives. The challenge for us is we want everything instantaneously. That's why we have our cell phones. We want information right now. 
That's why we record stuff on television so we can fast forward the commercials. That's why Amazon Prime now in some cities has same day delivery, which is just awesome. Not here in Modesto, but other cities, right? Why? Because we often want things instantaneously. The first thing we see from the Christmas story is that God works in and through unlikely times. Second of all, God works in and through unlikely ways. Unlikely ways. And we see this throughout the scriptures and we see this throughout people's lives that God often works in ways that we would not predict, that we would not choose, that we would not select. I think about in the, the book of Joshua when the Israelites are going to Jericho, instead of just making this mad rage into the city, God says, no, this is what I want you to do. I want you to march around the city for seven different days in a row and then blow your trumpets and then the walls are gonna come crumbling down. Why? Because God works in unlikely ways. And he did this in Mary's life. He did this in Joseph's life. And when he works in unlikely ways, it allows us to refocus. And we refocus in four different ways. First of all, we refocus our faith. We refocus our faith. What was Mary's initial response to the angel's announcement that she would have a child? It was fear. Fear of what? Fear of criticism. What are people going to think? Maybe fear of uncertainty. What's the future going to have? And what's it going to hold? Maybe it's fear of inadequacy. How am I going to deal with this? How am I going to manage this? Fear of change. What's going to happen in the midst of all this? Yes, she had fear in her life. But in the midst of fear, she had this desire to do God's will. She had a willingness to pay the cost. She had a faith to trust God's promise. In the midst of all these fears, her simple res response was the response that we need to have. Lord, I am your servant May it be to me according to your will. Because at the end of the day, yes, we are going to be thrown curveballs in life. Yes, God is going to work in unusual ways. But we will always be somebody that either seeks to please ourselves or seeks to please God. And here's Mary and here's Joseph. They're, they're wanting to God, have, please God in a way that refocuses their faith. Not only do we refocus our faith, second of all, we refocus our minds. We refocus our minds. And I love what it says here about Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, 18 to 23. As Joseph begins to hear about this, this is the story. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." So just for a moment, put yourself in Joseph's shoes before the angel appears to him in a dream. He finds out his soon-to-be wife is pregnant. And what does he know? He knows one thing, that he is not the father. And so there's a couple things going on in Joseph's life when he doesn't realize that God is working in this way. The first thing he's asking is, God, how do I honor you? He was a righteous man. And then how do I honor Mary? Like her punishment back then in the Old Testament, the Old Testament law said that a woman was to be put to death, to be stoned if she got pregnant out of wedlock for something like this. So he's thinking, how can I respect her? How do I not publicly embarrass her? And God, how do I honor you? Because most of the time when we're throwing curveballs in life, our initial response is not, God, how do I honor you and how do I honor other people, especially when they've hurt me? Our response is, how is this going to affect my life and what are people going to think? I want to say that one more time. Our initial response is, how is this going to negatively affect me and what are people going to think? I was asking myself that question this last week. 
how is this going to affect me? And what are people going to think? I was at a coffee shop grabbing a cup of coffee, and there was a lady behind the counter that came up to me and said, hey, me and my coworker, we've been playing a game, and we've been trying to guess how old you are. And please don't be offended, but we want to see who came the closest. And do you mind? I said, no, not at all. Before I tell you what they said, I want to give you the opportunity right now to guess how old I am. You don't need to be nice. You can be honest. On the count of three, yell it out. One, two, three. Okay, how many of you guessed in your 30s? I just want to see a show of hands. God bless you. All right. How many of you guessed somewhere in your 50s? Anybody? Okay, I'm going to pray for some of you. Uh, I am 42 years old. All right. 42 years old. Don't let the gray hair fool you. All right. Uh, so I, was, I said, no, go ahead and whatever you think. And she said, well, he guessed uh, that you were uh, 47 years old, and I guessed that you were 52. <laughs> and I just got a big smile on my face, and she's, she's like, well, I said, well, he was a little bit closer. And she's like, really? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm 42 years old. And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, don't, please don't be offended. By the way, not a game you should probably play with other people, right? Uh, <laughs> And so I'm like, hey, not a big deal at all. Like a couple seconds later, a family from Shelter Cove came in, the husband and wife and their son. Uh, Deegan was there. And I said, hey, can I buy Deegan a donut? And they're like, sure. So I go to the front counter, and the lady's there, and she's still feeling kind of bad. And I said, hi. And she's like, hi. And I, I said, did you know that I'm a grandfather? And she's like, no, really? And I said, yes, um, I'm this boy's 52-year-old grandfather. Just messing with her, right? And she's like, oh, whatever. I got over it. I went outside, popped her tires, and went on with my life, right? <laughs> but if we're not careful, life can be all about how will this make me feel and what do other people think? And I love Joseph because his whole thought process during this is, God, what are you doing? How do I honor you? And how do I honor the people around me? Thinking about Mary. And so God works in unlikely ways that allow us to refocus our faith. It allows us to refocus our minds and our thinking. And we say that Joseph's thinking began to change as the angel appeared to him in a dream. Now, Joseph, it's okay. Joseph, you can trust me. The third thing that happens is we refocus our lives. We refocus our lives and I love the story about Joseph because he's refocusing his life. The, the change that takes place in our minds will always change the way that we live. And we see from Joseph in this story that he didn't say anything. He just lived in a way that honored God. Don't miss that. This is what it says in verse 24 and 25. This was Joseph's response. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him he took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. He did what the angel of the Lord commanded him to do. That was Joseph. Why? Because there's this refocusing of our lives that will take place. And when we refocus our lives, when we live this life of obedience, when God works in ways that we don't expect, it will always cost us. What did it cost Mary? Mary cost her her reputation. She knew that what was inside of her was of the Holy Spirit, but she also knew that people weren't going to believe her. I'm sure she lost friends. I'm sure she was gossiped about. I'm sure people made fun of her. I'm sure people would eventually not know that she was telling the truth until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. She knew that this would cost her her reputation. She knew that this would cost her her comfort that it would be uncomfortable walking through town and having people give you these dirty looks, these judgmental looks. And I'm reminded again, as we refocus our faith and our minds and our lives on what God is doing, it will always cost us. When we sense God working in our lives and calling us to take another job, even though it pays less money because there's more ministry opportunities, people will criticize us. When we sell our home and we move to another country because we feel God is calling us to be on the mission field, it will cost us comfort. When we forgive somebody else because they've hurt us and it's just the godly thing to do, it will be uncomfortable. People will criticize us. But when God works in ways that are unlikely, we refocus our lives and it's just going to cost us. Jesus put it this way in Luke 9.23, if anyone 
desires to come after me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, it will cost you. And it allows us to refocus our faith, refocus our minds, refocus our lives. But don't miss this lastly, we refocus our hearts. When God works in unlikely ways, our hearts get refocused on him. After the birth of Jesus happens, Mary has this moment in Luke chapter 2, and this is what it says. It says, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Our, our hearts get refocused when God works in unlikely ways. This happened for me in a radical way over eight years ago. Kelly and I have had two sons at the time. We were praying about adoption, excited about adoption. We believe that God put that um, on our hearts. And so we prayerfully selected an organization in Stockton to partner with. We went up there 10 different weeks in a row, got a bunch of training, watched a bunch of videos, took a bunch of classes, tried to prepare our hearts, did background checks. Uh, people came out to our house to make sure it was safe, all this kind of stuff. And then the waiting began. And they said, you know what, it, it could happen quickly, it could take a while. We were very open to whoever God would bring into our family. Um, but week after week after week happened and still no call from the adoption agency. We're just wondering, God, where are you? God, God, are you moving? Is this going to take forever? Week after week turned into month after month, after month, after month, after month, after month. I'll never forget in a parked car with Kelly in front of my aunt and uncle's house down in Pasadena, just wondering, God, what are you doing? Remember, we, we began to cry and just say, God, it's taking forever. What are you doing? We did not think it would be this difficult. God, are you at work? Like, what is going on? We got done praying, and I just tried to encourage Kelly and just saying, God, God has a plan. God has a purpose for our life. We don't know what it is, but it is hard to wait. We go and we hang out with my aunt and uncle and my cousins and all that. We had a great night. We're walking out to the car afterwards. It's, it's dark out. My aunt stops me. And says, hey, Jeremy, can I, can I talk to you for a second? And I said, sure. And she said, uh, hey, I just want you to know. Um, and I knew that my cousin uh, had been through a difficult season of life. She was 16 years old. But she said, I, I want you to know that your cousin is pregnant. She's three months pregnant, and she really wants you and Kelly to adopt her baby. We were taken back for a moment, and we just began to pray. We began to pray knowing and realizing in that moment that God works in unlikely ways. Six months later, Hallie Rose Elizabeth, now Oldenburger, was born, and she's our seven-year-old daughter. Why? Because God works in unlikely ways. He gives us different things than what we can ask for. Here's how it works, and this is what it looks like. You can say this, I asked for strength, and God gave me difficulties to make me strong. I asked for wisdom, and God gave me problems to solve. I asked for prosperity. God gave me a brain and energy to work. I asked for courage, and God gave me danger to overcome. I asked for love, and God gave me troubled people to help. I asked for favors, and God gave me opportunities. I received nothing I wanted, but I received everything I needed. Isn't that awesome? Why? Because God not only works in and through unlikely times, he works in and through unlikely ways. Thirdly, in your notes, God works in and through unlikely people. He works in and through unlikely people. The people that we would choose are not the people that God would choose. God chooses the unlikely people because God wants to get all the glory. It doesn't matter your age. Mary and Joseph were young. Zach and Raya and Elizabeth, they were, they were older. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter what family you come from. I think about the family tree, the genealogy of Jesus. There were people in his extended family, the background, that were just scandalous. And it's interesting in Matthew, yes, we know that he was from the line of David. Yes, we know that he was from the family of Abraham. But this genealogy is unique because it includes women. And if there were any women that were included, we would think it would be the women of faith, women like Rachel and Sarah and Leah. But no, that's not the case. It's people with a scandalous past. People like Tamar who slept with her father-in-law because he thought she was a prostitute. People like Rahab 
who was once a prostitute. People like Bathsheba, who isn't mentioned by name, but that's who King David uh, committed adultery with. People like Ruth, who in this, it's a Jewish genealogy, and she's not even a Jew. All of these people realized that they needed a Savior. Even Mary is in here. Mary equally recognized that she needed a Savior. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes Mary. Mary was not perfect. Mary was simply graced and favored by God. And she knew this. This is what she said in Luke. Luke chapter 1, 46 and 47. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God. What she say? My Savior. You know, one of the most powerful things we can do in this life is recognize and realize that we need a Savior. Mary recognized that. She realized that. It doesn't matter what family you come from. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Mary and Joseph were very poor. God thrives on using unlikely people. These are some of the unlikely people he used in the Bible. Jacob was a cheater. David was a murderer. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Peter denied Christ three times. Martha worried about everything. Zacchaeus was small and money hungry. His disciples fell asleep during pray, while praying. Paul was a Pharisee who persecuted Christians before becoming one. God uses unlikely people because he gets all the glory. See, God's doing this mighty work in Mary's life. And the question is, Mary, are you going to believe it? He's doing this unlikely work in Joseph's life. And the question is, is Joseph going to believe it? He's doing a mighty work in your life right now, though you don't sense it, you don't see it, you don't feel it. God's at work. Maybe we're not allowing him to work in our hearts and lives because we're pushing him out. But God is constantly pursuing us because that's what love does. The question is, do we believe it? See, as a father of my oldest son, Jacob, who's 13 years old, has special needs, doesn't walk, doesn't talk, doesn't eat. Uh, God used two unlikely people to prepare my heart to be a, a father to him. And you may think, you know, is it your dad or your mom? No. Was it somebody that was super spiritual? No. Was it a close friend? No. One of my first years in college, I was still going to my dad's church, a small church in Sacramento, and there's this man named David Miller. David Miller would pull up his electric wheelchair next to me, it was reclined. He couldn't walk. He couldn't talk. He could eat, and he loved donuts. And so I remember in that Bible study, I wouldn't pay attention to what they were talking about, but what I would pay attention to is ripping off pieces of donuts and putting them in the sides of David's mouth so he could enjoy a donut. And I would wipe his mouth, and I would ask him if he wanted more, and just about every time it's, you know, it's a big smile and nod yes. Ten years later, I'm doing junior high ministry in Pasadena, and there's a eighth grader named Devin Hanrahan. And Devin could not walk, he could not talk, but he could eat through his mouth. And I remember ripping off pieces of food. He loved hot dogs. I'd rip off pieces of hot dog, and I'd feed Devin, and I'd wipe his mouth. Years later, I realized that God used unlikely people in my life, people with special needs, to help prepare me to be the father God wants me to be. Sometimes we don't see it at the time, but we have to realize that God works, and when he works, it's in unlikely times, in unlikely ways, in and through unlikely people, and fourthly, in, and, in your notes, in and through unlikely places. Where was Jesus born? He was born in Bethlehem, an unlikely place. Micah chapter five, verse two puts it this way. It says, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel. Unlikely places. It wasn't a large city. It was a small city. Why? Because God chooses the unlikely. An unlikely place, Bethlehem. Now, was Jesus born in a palace? No, he was born in a stable. Another unlikely place. There was no room in the inn. And after that, if that's not enough, where was Jesus placed? He was placed in a manger, a feeding trough, where, where, where animals could eat. 
unlikely place after unlikely place after unlikely place. Why? Why wasn't Jesus born in this palace with gates and with guards? Because Jesus came in humility, and coming in humility, he wanted every human being to know that he is always approachable, always accessible, and always available. I want to say that one more time. That Jesus, in his humility, wants every single one of us to know that he is always approachable, always available, and always accessible. But God works in unlikely places. You know, there's another place that I am fully confident God is going to use to do great things. It's this unlikely place of Modesto, California. And here's why. There's a special church in Modesto called Shelter Cove Community Church. Now, why is it an unlikely place? Well, if you go to Forbes magazine in 2013, you would see that the first, the fifth worst place to live, number five, in the United States of America was Modesto, California. Sorry if I discouraged you. That's just reality, all right? We've climbed the ladder. I think we're number six now, all right? Uh, I'm just messing with you. But it's an unlikely place where I believe God is going to do a mighty work. Why? Because Shelter Cove is different, because there's an authenticity, there's a love, there's a grace, there's a truth that flows from the people that's radically contagious. And here's what I believe are some of the things that's going to happen over the next 5, 10, 15 years is that we will have conferences at our church where people come from the Central Valley, where people come from out of state that will encourage marriages, that will encourage missionaries, that will encourage pastors, that will encourage leaders. Why? Because God's doing a mighty work in and through an unlikely place. I mean, what would happen if there were no more available adoptions in Modesto because the people of Shelter Cove said we want to be a mother and a father to the fatherless? What if there were kids in foster care that weren't getting bounced around a ton and having these horrible experiences because the people of Shelter Cove said, you know what, we want to be a foster mom and a foster dad to kids that desperately need it. We want to demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ. What if we all gave sacrificially in such a way where there weren't people that were hungry in Modesto, where the Modesto Pregnancy Center was just thriving, without permission, was thriving, Uh, Salvation Army thriving. Why? Because we're a church that lives radically and we give generously. See, God thrives from working in and through places that are unlikely. He uses unlikely times, unlikely ways, unlikely people, and unlikely places. And here's the reality in your notes. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Don't miss that. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And for most of it, us, it will always be different from what we imagined, what we planned. Why? Because once again, God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And if we're not careful, we can be quick to look at this story of Mary and Joseph and say, yeah, but the angel came to them and they they knew what was going to happen and they had it easy. No, it was messy. Just like your life, it was messy. Because months later, they're running for their lives. They're fleeing to Egypt because this wicked king, Herod, wants to kill Jesus. God is is at work in the midst of your messiness. So the question for Mary, the question for Joseph was, do they trust him? The question God keeps asking me is, Jeremy, do you trust me? It's the same question that God's asking you, do you trust him? Do you trust that even though you can't sense God and see God and feel God, that God is a God at work because that's what love does? God has a plan and a purpose for your life. But here's the question. Where in your life do you need to trust God is at work? In your notes, where in your life do you need to trust that God is at work? Don't put your pens away quite yet. For some of you, it's in your marriage. For some of you, it's with your family. For some of you, it's your relationship with God. For some of you, it's your faith. For some of you, it's your finances. For some of you, it's your health. 
For some of us, we've been praying and asking that God would do a mighty work in a situation, and we fail to recognize that God is trying to do a mighty work in our hearts. Where in your life do you need to trust that God is at work? You've got a line underneath that question, and I want to encourage you to write it down. To be honest with God, to be honest with yourself in your bulletins. What's that area of your life where you're like, God, I just don't see you working. But I'm going to believe moving forward that you, in some way, shape, or form, are at work. Because I've been reminded again today that, God, you work in and through unlikely times, unlikely ways, unlikely people, and unlikely places. Let's bow. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thanks for being awesome. God, thank you for working in ways that surprise me and shock me because it keeps me anchored and focused on you. And God, for some of us that are here today, we've bought into the lie that it's too late. Too late for you to work. It's too late for you to do your thing in our lives. It's too late for you to change this situation. It's too late for you to change us. God, help us to be men and women that refuse to believe that it's too late because all things are possible. God, would you give us faith to trust that you're at work? even when we don't sense you, even when we don't see you, even when we don't feel you. God, thank you for being a God that's capable of anything, that's capable of doing any work in our lives and through our lives. And thank you for the impact of Christmas, the reminder that you're at work. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.